Hey guys, what's up? And welcome back to my channel. So this series right now is so new, but I pitched this idea to you guys on Instagram and you guys loved it. Like I was surprised by how many other people love crime videos. Like I listen to it all the time. I listen to it when I'm in the car, when I'm doing my makeup, when I'm showering, whatever it is, I'm always listening to true crime. So when I pitched this idea, it was kind of like a shot in the dark, like shot in the dark. Cause I was like, oh, like, do you guys want me to do some crime videos? Because I freaking love them. I got an overwhelming amount of people that were like, yes, Courtney, please do it. So without further ado, I want to go ahead and introduce you to the new series on my channel, The Courtroom. This is basically the courtroom where I present the case to you guys. I try to give you as many details as I possibly can. Even though it might seem irrelevant, I think that little details just can seriously make a big difference in whether or not like you kind of fall on one side or another. I'm gonna be giving you guys as much information as I possibly can. And at the end of the video, you get to be the judge and you can head down to the comments and you can decide, all right, do I think that she's guilty? Do I not think she's guilty? And you guys can kind of debate, but my only rule is like, listen, on this channel, I get zero hate. Everyone just here is really kind. And really sweet and so if you want to debate people you're welcome to debate but just keep it friendly you have never had an issue with like hate or people being mean so it's not gonna start today but yeah welcome to the new series Woo! yeah this is just different i'm so used to like bubblegum and rainbows and everything just being so happy and so it's a little different to hop into true crime because obviously these are real cases these are real people and it's actually pretty tragic and before we go ahead and get started i actually whoa that was weird but anywho i know you guys just want to get to the actual video but i want to go ahead and give three shout outs out real quick these are people who are always loving to my channel and whenever i said i wanted to do a true crime video you guys were one of the very first people to reach out to me and just tell me how great of an idea that is so the very first one goes out to amanda um, i'm gonna go ahead and put her instagram right here she is just incredible she goes oh my gosh i love true crime videos me too the next one also goes to amanda i'll put it right here this is actually my hairstylist so if you're ever in the Pittsburgh area and you need to get your hair done, highly recommend you check out Amanda. And the next one is Nora. She said, this is so cool. You're definitely on the right track. Oh my gosh, I would love to watch you do true crime videos. So here we are. Now this case that we're gonna be talking about today is such a wild ride. And I will explain to you everything and you will understand because it is just crazy. Oh my gosh, like it involves zombies, an end of the world cult, two missing kids, five deaths, multiple states, and a grave digger's wife. Oh, and evil spirits. If that doesn't make it any crazier. Now to our big story, one that is capturing the nation's attention. At the center of it all, two missing kids who lived here in Arizona. The children's mother sits behind bars tonight accused of child abandonment. There is still no sign of the kids. Please give them back to us. To my knowledge, uh, those people are all missing or dead. The two kids, JJ and Tylee, still missing now for more than five months. Like there's just so many pieces. Like I'm gonna try really hard to put everything in chronological order. There's just so many different layers. So I'm gonna try my best to not confuse you, but I wouldn't be surprised if you end up being confused because I was confused. I had done so much research. I spent the last four days just doing nothing but researching this case. And it's crazy. There's like so much misinformation or like I said, there might be like one thing that comes out, but then later on, because this is an ongoing case, like something else is speculated and something else is speculated. So I've done my best to put it together. If anything changes, we might have to do an updated video, but let's just go ahead and dive right into it this was a long enough intro so this whole case actually starts in 2018 but everything started to unravel in summer of 2019. The Vallow family consisted of Lori and Charles Vallow and then their two kids JJ and Tylee. They were all living in Chandler, Arizona. Lori is described as beautiful, kind, and generous to a fault. Growing up she was involved in a bunch of sports. She did dance, she did cheerleading, and she was even a part of her church's softball league that her mom coached. She seemed popular, smart, and she she was from a very devout Mormon family. Later, she'd become a hairstylist because she just loved making people feel good and feel beautiful. And even her friends, it was crazy, during the case, her friends were even like, I know this looks really bad, but Lori would never hurt her kids or anyone else's. And a lot of people said that she was just this incredible mother and completely devoted to her kids. Now, Tylee wasn't, I mean, it was hers, but it was from a previous marriage. One thing to know about Lori is that she was actually married five different times, which is a lot. And that is definitely going to play into this case a little. And then there's JJ, who isn't actually hers. It's a little bit of a long story. Um, JJ is in the family, but isn't technically hers, but she adopted JJ. And it's just so crazy because so many people said that Lori just 
had such a great relationship with their kids. It was even said that Tylee looked up to Lori and that she just wanted to be like her mom. In 2014, Lori and Charles, they decided to up and move to Hawaii. They wanted to open up some sort of a juice bar. So they go down there and Lori actually gets introduced to some guy named Chad Daybell. So Chad Daybell, he is a very interesting character because he was a writer and he owned his own small publishing company. And so he was very known for this book series that he had called Standing in Holy Places. This was a series of five books talking about how the current world as we know it is coming to an end and how the LDS people were going to handle it and how they could prepare for the end of the world. So all of his books were very doomsday focused. Um, and actually as I was doing my research, a lot of people compare him to L. Ron Hubbard because I don't know if you know anything about L. Ron Hubbard. He's actually the founder of Scientology and actually how L. Ron Hubbard even got his following or really started Scientology was he started writing these books, um, these like fictional books about this like religion that he created and all of this stuff and next thing you know he started getting like this big cult following and everyone started, not everyone, but like a good group of people started to come in and like just kind of started like worshiping him and like seeing him as like this leader and it just I don't know I find Scientology so fascinating so if you guys ever want me to do a whole video on Scientology I'll save that for another video but it is wild the stuff that like you can just conjure up in your imagination and next thing you know you get like a cult following it's nuts to me now on top of these books, he also had a podcast where he would prepare people for the apocalypse and his friends actually claimed that he received these visions from beyond the veil. Now one thing to note about Chad is that he he believed that he had some sort of magical powers and that he could speak to the dead. He believed that he was a psychic or a prophet. He would also have these dreams and he would tell people that he knew how the end of the world was gonna happen and when the end of the world was going to happen. And I mean, this guy really, really thought that he had these powers and that he was some sort of chosen one. But at this time, Chad was actually married to a woman named Tammy Daybell. She was a school librarian and she actually helped him with his publishing company. So one day they just decided they were going to up and move to Salem, Idaho. And the reason behind this is because Chad was hearing voices in his head and supposedly these voices that he was hearing in his head told him that if he moved to Salem, Idaho, that it would just give him tremendous blessing, not only for his kids, but also for his grandkids. Meanwhile, while all this is happening, um, Lori and Charles, they're still together. So they decide they're gonna move back to Chandler, Arizona from Hawaii. But for some reason during this time, like Lori just couldn't shake the idea of Chad Daybell. Like she was just so fascinated with him and then this, like his books and everything that he believed. Like she just couldn't shake it. There was some sort of fascination there. I haven't told you guys a whole lot about Charles yet. I'm gonna be honest with you, he's not a big part of the case. Um, soon you will find out why. But I did want to tell you guys that Lori's mom and actually a couple of the friends of the Vallow family Family just said that Charles was the best of all the guys that Lori had married. Out of all of her husbands, Charles was definitely the best. He just absolutely adored Lori and just went out of his way to just make sure that she was always happy and always comfortable. Now on December 5th of 2018, Lori and Chad met up again. Now, Lori just, again, like she just couldn't shake Chad. Like she was just so into this doomsday stuff and they actually did a podcast episode together. And in a weird way, they were kind of perfect for each other just because they both believed that they had these superpowers and they both believed in this end of the world stuff and that they started to believe that they were some sort of God. They believed that they had lived thousands of previous lives. And Chad had actually told Lori that in seven of his past lives, he believed that he had married Lori. And so Lori kind of thought that this was like a little bit romantic. She was like, oh my goodness, like what are the odds that in another life we would have found each other? And so she was just eating this up. She just thought it was so romantic because what are the odds? 
And Chad even claimed at one point that he believed that he was Martin Luther, which I don't know if you guys know a whole lot about Martin Luther. I'm a Christian and so, and I grew up Catholic, so I do kind of know a little bit about it. So that is the person who broke off from the Roman Catholic Church and started the Lutheran Church. I think I get confused by that, just knowing what Chad believes in and knowing that he's a Mormon. I think it's just a little confusing that he would say that he was Martin Luther. I don't know, we're not judging on this channel, but I just thought it was a little odd. At one point, Chad even tells Lori that he had this vision that they were chosen by God to help with the second coming of Jesus Christ and that their job was to go out into the world and share this information that the world is ending and even though like they don't call this a cult I'm not gonna lie guys it really feels like a cult to me I mean they say that it's not but I mean Chad Daybell was gaining a little bit of a cult following like these people looked at him like he really was like a god or that he really was like this leader and so Chad tells Lori that the 144,000 would meet in their backyard for the second coming and so being a Christian I've read the Bible it's just really interesting because the 144,000 actually does come out of the book of Revelation. We're not gonna dive into that, but it's just really interesting because I just feel like he's kind of like, ooh, 144,000, that sounds great. Like, and just kind of like, I don't know. It just seems like he's like rewriting his own sort of Bible or like his own sort of story. Now, one thing to note about Chad and Lori is that they believed in light and dark spirits. They believed that there were people on this earth that were not themselves and that their true spirit wasn't actually in their body and it was replaced by a zombie. I just, I don't know. I just can't, like this is just, it's, it's sad is what it is. It honestly is just sad. Like it just seemed like the only people that they really call like called a zombie were people that were very convenient for them. And also, can we just take a moment? I feel like I'm gonna spoil this for you, but after you kill the first zombie and like they don't return into their body, you would just kind of assume that, you know, maybe they were wrong and that maybe their spirit doesn't actually go back into their body. That's just me. After all of this, Lori was really starting to freak out her friends because she was saying all this crazy stuff and she was referring to herself as some sort of translated being. She even had a list of different elites and celebrities that she believed had been taken over by dark spirits and are now zombies. But there was one celebrity that she felt like was the leader, like higher than all of the other dark spirits. And that one is no other than Oprah Winfrey. Now at this point, as you guys can imagine, Charles is realizing that Lori is kind of like losing her mind. And he's like, this girl is not the woman that I married. I don't understand. She believes in zombies and she believes that she's some sort of a god and she's getting these visions and that, you know, all this stuff. So he goes and files for a divorce. Like even at one point, like she drains Charles' bank account. She steals a truck. She locks him out of the house. And uh, yeah, and then she steals the kids and drives them away. So stuff was getting pretty crazy to say the least. And at one point, like Charles even called the cops and was like dude I think she's gonna murder me like he was really afraid and there's video footage of him saying like I think she's going to kill me she took all the money out of her bank account today Wait, what did she say yesterday she said you're not Charles I don't know who you are what you did with Charles but I can murder you now with my powers so she's speaking as a spiritual being is she on any medications no no she won't do medications she okay. says has she been to a doctor she won't go to the doctor because she's a translated being and they would find out she's translated. She cannot be killed. She cannot die. And that's what she thinks? Yes. He told me that Lori told him that she was going to have him killed, that he was in the way, and that she had an angel that would dispose of his body after that took place. But with no evidence, the police really can't do a whole lot. But little did they know what was about to happen. Charles actually goes and gets a court order for Lori to get a mandatory psych evaluation done at a mental health facility. And I mean, like he did everything right. And I think that's what's so sad about this case is like he told the police, he actually called Lori's family and was like, hey, something's not right with her. He got a court order for her to go and get a psych evaluation done and when he was filing for a divorce he actually told the attorney like hey this is going on like if I show up dead like I want you to tell people that Lori is the one who did it to me like he was so adamant he knew what was coming he knew that something was just off so he's literally afraid for his life at this point so he bounces he's like peace I'm going to Texas I'm not dealing with any of this stuff so he leaves and Lori actually goes down and visits him just to make sure that his finances were in order basically he had a 
one million dollar life insurance policy and she just wanted to go down there and make sure that with everything going on with the divorce and all that stuff she just wanted to make sure that the money would go to her and it wouldn't go to his sister in july of 2019 charles comes into town to pick up jj at this time alex cox is living in the house with lori so that is lori's brother so i think that we should talk about alex cox for a quick second because he actually ends up being a super important role to this whole case and i haven't even gotten to the case like this is what's so crazy is like there's so many layers to this case that i haven't even really got to the main part of this case so alex is lori's brother um he is an aspiring comedian and he actually wanted to get into voice acting i think that's all According to the family, Charles and Alex got along so well. They loved each other. But it seemed like after the recent fallout with Lori, Alex was no longer fond of Charles. So in July of 2019, when Charles went to go pick up JJ, there was some sort of altercation. I guess Charles somehow, he got a bat and Alex shot Charles in self-defense. I don't have a whole lot of details about the case. I know you can actually like look up the body cam footage and all that stuff. I personally think that getting into that is a little bit irrelevant and also we could just go into a whole nother hole he seems so unbothered he seemed super nonchalant like i don't know about you guys but if i killed someone oh my gosh i would be shaking i'd be so scared because self-defense is not the easiest thing to prove at all and so when you say that something is self-defense like it literally i would be afraid if someone broke into my own house as a girl to shoot someone in self-defense just because it is so hard to prove and alex just seemed so unbothered he just killed someone no big deal what is the emergency? Um, uh, I I shot my brother-in-law. Was he armed also, or just? Yeah, he he came at me with a bat. Anyone been drinking or doing drugs or anything today? Or no? I I don't know, but I've never seen him that enraged before. Okay, what part of his body is injured? In the chest. Okay, is he awake and responsive or unconscious? Unconscious. Now here are a few things that seemed extremely suspicious to the police. First, on the 911 call, Alex just seemed so uninterested in performing CPR. The second is that Alex, after he did perform CPR on a man that just got shot in the chest, when he comes out of the house to meet with the police, he had no blood on him. Which is so weird considering if you just perform CPR on a man who was shot in the chest, you would think that you would be a bloody mess. But when Alex came out of the house, he had no blood on him. Make sure you're still pressing down at least two inches into his chest and it comes up with each compression. One, two, three, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And the last thing that seemed really weird is according to his family, Charles had played baseball his entire life. He had a pretty good swing. And so if what Alex said was true and that Charles hit him with the bat, there would be like a mighty bruise. There would be like a welt or there would be something. But Alex completely just denied medical attention. He didn't want to be looked at at all. Instead, he asked for water and he continued to talk about the weather. What's even more bizarre is that Lori actually decides that she's going to take Tylee and JJ to school. Now keep in mind, Charles was going to pick up JJ and take him to school. So it's just like the timing just doesn't add up because that would either mean that as the altercation is happening, Lori decides to take the kids to school or immediately after. Now people think that this is super suspicious because if your husband, I mean, they're getting a divorce, but they're still, you know, that's still your husband. That's still a man that you fell in love with. If he's bleeding out, right? He was just shot in the chest. They think it's really weird that she would just leave and take the kids to school. I would say that I kind of see the other side of it. I think that if there was a bloody crime scene in my house i would not want my kids to see it so i think i would immediately be like all right kids get in the car get in the car get in the car like we're leaving just because i wouldn't want my kids to witness that kind of trauma i could also see like you i don't, I don't know i don't know like people find that super weird but i can maybe see like not wanting the kids to witness something like that, but I don't know. I don't know, leave your comments down below on whether or not you think that's super weird. And most people believe that none of Alex's story is true. They believe that Lori just wanted Alex to kill Charles because she believed that he was a zombie. So now Charles has passed and exactly what Lori didn't want to happen, happened. All of his life insurance policy actually went to his sister and not her. In the following weeks, Lori, JJ, Tylee, Alex, and Lori Lori's niece, Melanie, they all decided to up and move to Rexburg, Idaho. This might not seem weird, but uh, just 
10 minutes, it's like literally a 10 minute drive, to Salem, Idaho, which is where Chad Daybell lived. So Lori claims that she just got a job opportunity out there, but let's be real. She just wanted to be with him, okay? On September 24th, 2019, Lori actually went ahead and unenrolled JJ in Kennedy Elementary School. And the school thought that was a little bit weird because the school year had just started, but Lori reassured them that she was just going to homeschool JJ from now on. On October 2nd, Brandon, who we actually haven't really got to talk about, so I mentioned Lori's niece, Melanie, actually went up to Rexburg, Idaho with Lori. This is her husband. 911, where's your emergency? Um, someone just shot my window. Okay, someone shot uh, at your vehicle? Yeah, and it hit my window, it shattered my driver's side window. Okay. Sorry, I'm a little off breath. They just... And what is your name? My name's Brandon Foudreau. So one night out of the blue, his vehicle was shot at. So immediately, obviously, he calls the cops and he's like, hey, like my vehicle was just shot out. And the police ask him, did you see who did it? And he believes that he saw Alex Cox in Charles's old red Jeep. This man, Brandon Boudreau, says his ex-wife, Lori's niece, is also part of the cult, that he could have ended up a victim, but instead was the spouse who got away. All I could think was, Someone's shooting at me. What do I need to do? I need to hit the gas and get out of here. I just wonder why you couldn't just get divorced like normal people and just go be together if that's what you wanted. I don't, I don't know why they're doing what they're doing. It doesn't make any sense. So luckily he got away, but what's weird is Brandon also has a $1 million life insurance policy. Like I'm starting to think that if I ever get a $1 million life insurance policy that I should never tell anyone because it seems like that's like a big motive for a lot of people and that honestly just freaks me out. Like I I would be afraid to tell my spouse at this point. <laughs> and then on October 19th, Chad's wife, Tammy, is pronounced dead. And it's really weird because Chad had actually previously stated that he knew she was going to die soon because he had a vision. And this is just bizarre because if you think about it, now there's two people dead and one assaulted. And just 10 days prior to this whole thing happening with Tammy, she actually went on her Facebook page to say that there was a man in a ski mask that was standing by the back of her car with what she thought was a paintball gun. Her death was just so out of the blue. And again, they just said that she died in her sleep of natural causes. But it's just weird because at this Time she was also training for a marathon so she didn't really I mean she was healthy so it's just weird because healthy people don't just drop dead in their sleep and if you think about it just three months prior Lori's husband also just died so now Chad and Lori are free to be together two weeks after Tammy died Lori and Chad they get together and they decide that they are going to escape to Hawaii and get married. And I mean, their photos are absolutely beautiful. Like they just had this beautiful ceremony. But what was really weird is that no one from the family was invited and the kids didn't go either. On November 26th, I mean, everything seems to be going so great. Like Lori and Chad just had this beautiful wedding in Hawaii until people really just start piecing together that they haven't seen the kids in months. And so the police actually go to do a wellness check on JJ and Tylee. And when they show up to the house, Chad and Alex were there. And so the police talk to Chad first and they say, hey, like, where are the kids? And Chad's like, I don't know. Honestly, Chad actually acts like, even though they're married, that he barely knows Lori. Going as far as when the police asked for Lori's cell phone number, he acted like he didn't have it. And then when they talked to Alex, Alex kind of blew it off and was like, oh my gosh, JJ is perfectly fine. He's with his grandparents. And that is when the police get to look him straight in the eye and say that is very unlikely considering JJ's grandparents are the ones that called for the wellness check. So they finally track down Lori and they ask Lori, where are your kids? And of course, Lori says, oh my gosh, it's all fine. Like she just acts like everything is so nonchalant. Like why is everyone so worried about these kids? Like JJ's with my friend Melanie, not to be confused with Melanie as in her niece, Melanie. It's a different Melanie. So the police leave and Lori immediately calls Melanie and says, hey, the police are gonna be calling you. I need you to lie for me. I need you to say that JJ is with you. Lori even suggested that Melanie should go to a local movie theater and take a group, uh, like take a photo of a group of kids and say that JJ was one of them. And obviously Melanie was really freaked out. If someone asked me to do that, I'd be like, no. <laughs> I'm not doing that. So Melanie calls the police and basically says exactly what happened. Melanie also testifies that she called Alex Cox and said, where are the kids? Like, what is going on? And he says, 
you don't want to know. So the police show up to Lori and Chad's house in Idaho. They are ready to investigate because they're like, what is going on? Like no one is giving a, a, a gus. Blah, 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 blah. They're not giving us a clear answer as to what is going on. We don't know where the kids are. You're not telling us whether or not they're safe or not showing us any proof that they're even okay. So they go in there, they're ready to investigate, but Lori and Chad had already left Idaho and flew to Hawaii. And the police actually went ahead and they checked the flight records and the kids didn't go with them. What's even more weird about this is Alex Cox is also nowhere to be found. He actually went ahead and escaped to Vegas to go marry his girlfriend. I mean, maybe you guys don't think that's weird, but what is weird is that he wanted to take her last name. Now I'm not trying to like stir up the pot with gender norms, but typically the girl takes the guy's last name. The guy doesn't tend to take the girl's last name. Thought that was a little bit strange. And the police did too. They definitely knew that something is going on here, but they don't have enough evidence to arrest anyone. So they just kind of keep a watchful eye out on them. On December 12th, 2019, Alex Cox ends up dead. Now, according to the medical report, they said that he died of natural causes. So again, this is now three deaths one assaulted, just putting that out there. Now, Melanie, the one who lived in Arizona, she had a theory. She believed that maybe he died of stress. Maybe he knew all along where Tylee and JJ were and the whole thing was just so stressful that he just died. On December 20th is when the police officially announced JJ and Tylee as missing. Whenever kids go missing, it is so, so important to report it as fast as possible. The first 24 to 48 hours is crucial, honestly, in finding them and making sure that they are safe. At this point, it had been months. Because remember, Lori had actually unenrolled JJ from school on September 24th. And so it's like, did he go missing then? Was it after? We don't know. A few weeks later on January 25th, the police serve them with documents saying that they have to produce their kids in court or they have to provide some sort of physical evidence that their kids are safe somewhere. The next day, January 26th, they're in Hawaii, they have their rental car, and they actually get pulled over. And in the car, they were able to find JJ's and Tylee's birth certificate. They found JJ's school registration, his iPod, and they found Tylee's debit card. So this isn't looking very good for them. And Lori and Chad refuse to talk. They will not talk to reporters. They will not talk to the police. They won't even talk to their family. And so the time comes rolling around where they had to bring their kids to court or they had to provide some sort of evidence that they were completely safe and silence. On February 20th, they finally arrest Lori on a $5 million bail. They actually eventually reduced that to 1 million, but she still couldn't pay it. So she had to just sit in jail. And at this point they didn't have enough evidence on Chad because they just didn't know if he was connected or they just really just didn't have the evidence. So he's roaming around free while Lori is in jail. While she was in prison, that's when this whole zombie thing came out to the public. That's when her friends came out and they discovered that she believes that there's these light beings and dark beings and you could become a zombie and the only way to kill the zombie is to kill the person and then the original soul will go back into their body and that she believed in this doomsday cult and the world was ending and all of this stuff. That is when everything started to come to the surface. So it wasn't until June 9th, around 7 a.m. that the police showed up to Chad Daybell's property in Idaho. So they start digging and after a few hours, unfortunately, they did find the remains of of JJ and Tylee. And while the police were actually in the backyard digging, Chad was just chilling in his house. But whenever he got word that the first set of remains had been found, he immediately got in his car and started driving. Like he was trying to get out of there. But of course the police just followed him, arrested him. And then, I mean, honestly, it's pretty obvious who did it at that point. So the first set of confirmed remains were JJ. And this is just, it's so sad to report on because I think sometimes like you just think that these are like fictional cases, but these are real people. These are real people and real lies. And so JJ was the very first one that they found. They found him wrapped in plastic and duct tape. And then the second set of remains they believe were Tylee's. They found her body dismembered and spread throughout the property. Oh my gosh. 
it's just so morbid and they even said that some pieces of her body were burned if it's just heartbreaking enough for me to like research it and tell you guys about it like i can't even imagine what it's like for jj's grandparents like they're the ones who called for the welfare check and because they were just so worried about jj they just hadn't seen jj and i don't think that this is what they thought the outcome would be so now let's get to who did it um i mean i'm pretty sure you have a pretty good idea as to who did this because now you have five dead bodies, right? You have Charles, you have Tammy, you have Alex, and then you have JJ and Tylee. And then you have Brandon who was assaulted by who he thinks was Alex Cox. So now let's dive into who did it. I'm sure you guys have a pretty good idea as to who you guys think did it, but obviously we need some evidence. So let's rewind all the way back to September 22nd. So remember, September 24th is when Lori unenrolled JJ from school. Just keep that in mind. So on September 22nd, this is the same day that Lori had actually been complaining to some of her friends saying that she believed that maybe JJ was a zombie. And so Alex comes over to the apartment, he picks up JJ and they go hang out for a little bit and then Alex eventually brings JJ back. And so at this time, uh, Lori actually had some house guests over. So they spend the night, they wake up and they notice that JJ is gone. And they thought that was a little bit weird because Alex had picked up JJ, brought JJ back and then in the next morning, JJ was gone and so they asked Lori hey what happened like where's JJ at and Lori just said oh don't worry he was being really fussy in the middle of the night so Alex came and picked him back up now phone pings are going to be a really important part of this case too so the police had this technology that is just crazy accurate they can pin your phone to the exact location that you were to up to 20 feet so they can tell if you were outside the property they can tell if you're inside the property it is crazy accurate so on the 23rd after it was reported that JJ was acting up and so Lori called Alex to go pick him back up. It was reported that Alex was at Lori's house from 2.42 to 3.37 a.m. And then he was pinged again at 9.21 a.m. on Chad's property outside and so they think that he had only buried one set of remains at that time but i mean that pretty much just tells you it right there in my opinion i definitely think that he had some sort of involvement people were really upset that there wasn't like an immediate arrest at this point but it's like they could prove that he was there but they couldn't prove like who was there like who had his phone or they couldn't prove who actually killed the kids they could just prove that he was there at that property at that time and so what's also really weird is we rewound so at this point Tammy is still alive and Chad actually texted Tammy. Tammy actually had a pet cemetery in the backyard because she just, she loved animals and she just, I don't know, she just had this pet cemetery. It wasn't creepy, she did something that she did. Chad actually texted Tammy that day and said that they found this gigantic raccoon, they shot it, and now they're going to be burying it in the pet cemetery. I mean, if I'm being honest, I think he just wanted to save his butt, right? So if she comes home and she sees them digging something, he didn't want her to be suspicious, or if she comes outside after work or whatever, after she comes home from being a librarian, and she sees that there's a fresh hole in the cemetery, like obviously that would raise some red flags. So I think he just wanted to save his butt. What's also really weird is the police actually said that they did not find any raccoon remains. So, I mean, you can leave that up to your own interpretation, but I think it's pretty obvious what they were doing. I also found this other piece of information that I don't know where it falls, but I feel like it is really important to just say it right now. So it says the newest indictment alleges that Lori, Chad, and Alex conspired with an unnamed person to kill the children and still steal, sorry, the social security survivor benefits that the children were entitled to after the death of their father. One piece of information that I didn't mention was that Tylee's father, it's not Charles and it's not Chad, it was before Charles, he actually died in 2018 of a reported heart attack. So did Lori kill him too? Like, I don't know, like, this is crazy. So now let's fast forward to today. What is going on? Where are they? So obviously you know that Alex Cox is dead he died of natural causes i think that one is just so crazy because i mean honestly they're probably just gonna pin most of the stuff on him if i'm being honest he's he's deceased now so i think that just i think that's what they're gonna do but i think he played a way bigger role in this than 
we think, but he is not here to speak for himself. And that raises a bunch of other things. Like, did Lori kill him? Did Chad kill him? We honestly don't know. But as for right now, where they are at, I'm actually just gonna go ahead and read it straight off my notes because I do not want to mess this up. So Lori and Chad, they're both currently in jail. So obviously Lori has been in jail since she couldn't produce the kids, right? And then Chad, I mean, obviously has been in jail since they found the kids' remains in his backyard. And so Lori and Chad, they're both currently in jail and each indicted by the grand jury on charges of conspiracy, murder, and grand theft in the connection of the death of Lori Daybell's two kids. I'm not gonna lie, the grand theft confuses me a little, but I'm wondering if that's because she had like Tylee's debit card and like their birth certificates and stuff in their car whenever they got arrested in Hawaii. I think they're just trying to pin them with as much as possible to keep them in jail. And then on top of that, uh, Chad is charged with one count of murder and insurance fraud in the connection with the death of his late wife, Tammy, just weeks before he married Lori. And the most recent indictment says that both Chad and Lori they use their specific religious beliefs to justify and encourage the killings of her two kids and Tammy Daybell. So right now they've just been in jail for months, just waiting trial. It wasn't until May 25th, so just literally last month, that they were actually able to hit them with that murder charge because um, they just wanted to make sure that it was solid. What's also crazy is if they do get first degree murder and they are found guilty of that, they'd be facing the death penalty because Idaho that's legal in Idaho. So I think that's really crazy, um, but they're both still pleading not guilty. They're pleading not guilty for any of the charges. But once you put that, you know, death row in front of them, I'm wondering what is going to happen. I'm wondering if they're still gonna be pleading not guilty or if they'll try to cooperate with the police so that they don't get the death penalty. I truly don't know, but all I know is that it's not looking very good. And a lot of times when you put the death penalty in front of someone, like they will cooperate, you know, or or maybe one will pin up against the other. Like maybe the police will think that one was a little bit less involved than the other. And so they'll say like, okay, like you can just have life in prison rather than the death penalty. I don't know. I think that this is gonna be a really, really interesting case. And for example, like right now, Lori is actually claiming that she is unstable to stand in court. So yeah, her attorney is saying that um, she's incompetent to move forward with the court proceeding because of like the results of her psychological assessment. Um, sorry, I don't want to come across as like I'm judging her, but um, I think we can all agree that she isn't mentally fit right now. So now it is your turn to be the judge. Like it is your time. Like this is the courtroom. <laughs> I love this. This is the courtroom. So it's all up to you guys. Feel free. Leave your comments down below. What do you guys think happened? What do you think should happen? Do you think one is actually going to pin up against the other? Do you think that Alex Cox was the main person behind all of this? Do you think Lori is innocent? And and maybe Chad did this to her. Do you think that she's just mentally ill? Leave your comments down below. You are the judge right now. So take it, take away. it away. I am gonna be reading them all. And once again, I'm gonna be giving three shout outs to anyone who comments, gives us a big thumbs up, and also make sure you're subscribed. And I'll be giving three shout outs at the beginning of my next crime video. So this is so fun. Thanks for sticking along to the end. Um, I love you guys and I'll see you all later. Bye.